chapter three of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three balboa and the pacific when with eagle eyes he stared at the pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise silent upon a peak in darien keats on first looking into chapman's homer in his espanola letter of october fourteen ninety eight to the spanish sovereigns columbus told them two things first that he had discovered the earthly paradise which being on the top of the stem of the earth was near heaven and unattainable save by god's permission and second that at pariah he had found pearls the latter announcement was the moving one and in fourteen ninety nine two private expeditions set forth almost simultaneously to the pearl coast one piloted by juan de la cosa but commanded by alonso de ojeda a knight of truly spanish audacity companion of columbus in fourteen ninety three and the other commanded by pero alonso nino one of columbus's pilots in fourteen ninety three and fourteen ninety eight the voyage of nino so far as the gathering of riches was concerned proved a success quite beyond anything achieved by columbus for it was rewarded by quantities of pearls ojeda was less successful in finding pearls but he brought away some two hundred natives to be sold as slaves in fifteen hundred and eight he was made governor of the district of uraba which extended from the darien atrato river eastward to the gulf of venezuela and was called castilla del oro west of uraba as far as cape gracias a dios in honduras the coast under the appellation of baragua was in fifteen hundred and eight assigned for government to diego de nisuesa a rich and accomplished planter of espanola the significance of ojeda and Nequesa, however lies not so much in themselves as in their three associates vespucci balboa and pizarro especially in balboa the true precursor of cortez with whom in a variety of respects he is not unworthy to be compared as for vespucci and pizarro the latter we shall meet presently and the former need not long detain us he was be it said an alert florentine who as contractor's clerk had seen to the outfitting of the ships for the second voyage of columbus and who had accompanied ojeda on his pearl-seeking voyage of fourteen ninety nine he had made three other transatlantic voyages the third of which by his literary handling of it in letters printed in latin in fifteen hundred and four and fifteen hundred and seven the former under the title of mundus novus had so established his fame that in fifteen hundred and seven mundus novus south america was beginning to be called america americ's land or america but to revert to balboa just as from the third voyage of columbus renowned for its pearls there resulted the voyage of ojeda bringing to the mainland of the indies vespucci so in fifteen hundred there resulted the voyage of rodrigo de bastidas bringing vasca nunez de balboa of balboa prior to this time we know only that he was a good sword-player born in fourteen seventy four or fourteen seventy five in estramadura luckless at sea with bastidas he had resorted to farming in espanola and when in november fifteen hundred and nine ojeda and nicuesa started for their provinces he was restless to accompany one or other debt kept him back but he was resourceful and in september fifteen hundred and ten when ojeda's lieutenant martin fernandez de enciso prepared to follow his commander with supplies balboa it is said contrived to get himself 
smuggled on shipboard in a provision cask on the venezuelan coast near the present cartagena for it was here that enciso landed balboa encountered francisco pizarro a dutiful soldier under ojeda with a boatload of ojeda's men from him it was learned that ojeda having lost de la cosa in a fight and being himself seriously wounded had founded the refuge of san sebastian and then had departed for espanola for succour his colonists meantime desperate with hunger were roaming hither and yon in quest of food all straightway betook themselves to san sebastian but only to find it burned the question then arose as to what should be done in circumstances so adverse in answer up spoke balboa to the west of the gulf of uraba was a region darien abounding in food this he knew from having already visited it under bastidas there moreover the indians used no poisoned arrows missiles which had been the undoing of the headlong ojeda balboa was of good stature of knightly bearing and of frank address and his words took effect ojeda's colony transferred itself to darien where it founded santa maria la antigua del darien and being thus within the country which pertained to nisuesa promptly on balboa's suggestion deposed enciso and chose as alcades or judges balboa and martin zamudio and as regidor or alderman a young nobleman juan de valdivia where though in the meantime was nisuesa ojeda had reached new andalusia with three hundred men and four small ships nisuesa had appeared off castilla del oro with nearly seven hundred men and five ships of large size and was now sailing to and fro looking for columbus's veragua the golden Cheronese, but to no issue except the loss of ships and the drowning and starving of his men marooned at length upon desert sand nisuesa himself and sixty half-naked followers embraced despair some muttered some raved some in fierce irony laughed aloud a jest it was ha ha a merry jest to adventure life for gold for lands and to rule one's fellows nisuesa was finally found and brought back to darien by his lieutenant but the colony which was originally ojeda's distrusted nisuesa and in march fifteen eleven putting him on board a leaky brigantine dispatched him to spain and that was the last that they or any one heard of this overbearing commander at this time diego columbus elder son of christopher columbus presided over the antilles as governor and admiral with residence in espanola on the continent of america tierra firma which now comprised central america and mundus novus south america no one presided opportunity therefore called for a ruler in tierra firma and not in vain for there was a man to respond by name vasco nunez de balboa all he lacked was legal authorization to obtain this being so far from spain he must do mighty deeds make himself potent and indispensable and this he set himself to do first he deported enciso to spain sending with him to offset a possible misrepresentation of his action the alcalde zamudio in the same ship but commissioned to stop in espanola and solicit the favour of don diego he sent valdivia don diego proved malleable and soon appointed balboa his lieutenant thereupon balboa shaped a career for conquest and discovery a career in which two points that stand out are his recognition of pizarro and his employment of blooded dogs francisco pizarro was an estramaduran like balboa and of about the same age he was ambitious yet peculiar from the fact that in a period of restless competition he was content to bide to serve and to be ever dutiful 
with regard to the dogs they were no new thing with the spaniard bartholomew columbus had used them in espanola though not quite as balboa was to use them in darien their breed was of the best and their fangs were deadly but they were sagacious and under firm discipline gold was balboa's object but the prime immediate requisite was food Coretta, Cacique of cueva a district to the west of santa maria possessed both gold and food and he possessed furthermore a daughter balboa attacked the village of Coretta and carried the Cacique and his attractive daughter prisoners to santa maria here in turn the captor himself was made captive for he fell in love with the daughter and formed with Coretta an alliance against that Cacique's enemy Ponxa. to the west of Coretta lay a rich and populous country of the atlantic seaboard ruled by a Cacique Comogre, who to the amazement of the spaniards occupied a house constructed of posts and stone with carved woodwork an understanding with Comogre became practicable through the understanding with Coretta, and momentous did it prove it made of balboa a discoverer a world discoverer the discoverer of the south sea or pacific ocean an achievement which had it only come a little sooner would in all probability have brought with it the conquest of peru Camogre had seven sons one of whom Pansiaco, was of marked intelligence from him balboa learned of a Cacique dwelling beyond the high sierra on the pacific side of the isthmus of darien and possessed withal of much gold this gold balboa resolved to see the baskets full the bags full the large vessels out of which the people ate and drank and he would see also the new strange waters beyond the sierra where according to report were ships with sails and oars but little less in size than those of the spaniards themselves the difficulty confronting balboa was that such an adventure required many men all seasoned and well equipped a thousand pansiaco said whereas the spaniard had but a few hundred and these meagre for lack of food so pressing indeed was the demand for food in darien that in january fifteen hundred and twelve valdivia back from espanola was again sent forth this time expressly for provisions and to carry to diego columbus a letter telling of the great southward lying sea and employing the thousand men necessary for the seizure of its golden littoral nor was this all for balboa himself made an incursion into the country of the cacique da baeba a country not only by report in el dorado but what was more one known to be stocked abundantly with grain time sped and it now was october of fifteen hundred and twelve food had again run low and men and equipment were as scarce as before valdivia had failed to return nor had espanola been otherwise heard from but the determination of balboa to establish himself in power by a successful south sea venture remained unshaken commissioners were sent to spain to unfold the situation to the king and to solicit aid of him directly hardly had they gone when two ships arrived from diego columbus bringing provisions and one hundred and fifty men but they brought something even more important and that was news news from spain zamudio wrote that roused by inciso's recital of the wrong suffered by nisuesa king ferdinand had ordered first that balboa be brought home under criminal indictment and second that inciso himself be granted indemnification presumably zamudio wrote also of a rumour that the king had in mind to appoint a governor for darien at any rate balboa deemed it imperative to try to gain personally the royal ear and on january twenty fifteen hundred and thirteen he addressed to ferdinand his celebrated letter of exculpation description and appeal i desire to give an account to your most royal highness of the great secrets and marvellous riches of this land of which god has made your most royal highness the lord and me the discoverer before any other that which is to be found down this coast to the westward is the province called Coretta, which is twenty leagues distant further down the coast at a distance of forty leagues from this city santa maria and twelve leagues inland there is a cacique called camogra 
in the mountains to the southward there are certain caciques who have great quantities of gold in their houses it is said these caciques store their gold in barbacoas like maize because it is so abundant that they do not care to keep it in baskets that all the rivers of these mountains contain gold and that they have very large lumps in great abundance i sire have myself been very near these mountains within a day's journey but i did not reach them because i was unable to do so owing to the want of men beyond these mountains the country is very flat toward the south and the indians say that the other sea is at a distance of three days journey they say that the people of the other coast are very good and well mannered and i am told that the other sea is very good for canoe navigation for that it is always smooth and never rough like the sea on this side according to the indians i believe that there are many islands in that sea they say that there are many large pearls and that the caciques have baskets of them it is a most astonishing thing and without equal that our lord has made you the lord of this land then he asked for a thousand men from espanola for materials for the building of small ships pitch nails ropes and sails for master shipwrights and for arms two hundred crossbows with very strong stays and fittings and with long ranges two dozen good hand-guns of light metal to weigh not more than twenty-five to thirty pounds and for good powder none of balboa's demands however were to be granted indeed by the time his commissioners reached spain in may fifteen hundred thirteen it is probable that the decision had been made to supersede him of this as we have seen he had received intimation and with or without men and munitions he must act upon his action depended everything his fame his fortune and his life balboa set forth on september sixth fifteen hundred thirteen from coretta's country caledonia bay directly southward across the isthmus of darien to the gulf of san miguel with him he took one hundred and ninety spaniards he took also hundreds of indian slaves as attendants and burden-bearers coretta's daughter was still his spouse and through this fortunate connection he obtained provisions and guides the arms of his men were the usual swords crossbows and arquebuses but more formidable than all other means of foray were the dogs the bloodhounds the distance to be traversed was not great about forty-five miles but the obstacles were as formidable as the distance was trifling a cacique named caraqua proved the most redoubtable foe and fell upon the spaniards with a confident and yelling host he was however quickly put to flight by the discharges from the crossbows and arquebuses and after the fleeing men leaped the dogs then drawing their swords the spaniards according to peter martyr made bloody havoc hewing from one an arm from another a leg from him a buttock from another a shoulder and from some the neck from the body at one stroke the country at first was a succession of streams and swamps screened by interlacing vines and creepers the home of gorgeous flowers and brilliant birds but no less the dwelling-place of countless chattering monkeys and inconvenient reptiles everywhere stretched forests of trees stupendous dark and so festooned as to be almost impenetrable even to the axe at length the journey was over on the twenty fifth of september balboa was at the base of an elevation which his guides told him looked upon the sea of the south the mar del sur as the spaniards long henceforth were to call it some sixty-six or sixty-seven men only were equal to the ascent with these balboa clambered to a point near the summit bidding them pause the ambitious explorer went himself says peter martyr alone to the top here he looked long and prayed then he beckoned to his men who gathered about him and stared at the pacific among the number thus silent upon a peak in darien was francisco pizarro to him the situation was a congenial one duty had been performed and there was no need for utterance but what were his thoughts in the golden vessels said to be used by tu banama he did he surmise anything of peru quite likely not still distant regions of a new civilization were now and again heard of in darien once a refugee from the great lands far toward the west 
came upon a spanish official reading and starting with surprise exclaimed you also have books but this by the way pizarro the dutiful captain was now straightway sent forward by balboa to discover the shore of the sea they had gazed upon and on september twenty ninth fifteen hundred thirteen st michael's day balboa himself with drawn sword and uplifted banner advanced to meet the tide they stood facing a gulf and in honor of the day they named it san miguel and here there came to the spaniards an unmistakable intimation of peru tamaco cacique of one of the gulf tribes replying to questions by balboa as to the extent of this new coast told him that the mainland extended to the south without end and that far in that direction dwelt a nation fabulously rich who sailed the ocean in ships and used beasts of burden to illustrate the beasts he formed from clay the figure of the llama which seemed a kind of camel this says herrera the spanish historian was the second intimation vasco nunez and we may add francisco pizarro had of peru in fifteen hundred and thirteen darien was still to explorers as it had been to columbus the malay peninsula the golden Cherenese, the approach to india it is thought notes the indefatigable martyr that not far from the colony of san miguel lies the country where the fruitfulness of spice beginneth to dispel this illusion there was required the voyage of magellan a voyage not merely to america but through america and beyond it prior to the time of this voyage in fifteen hundred and nineteen to fifteen hundred and twenty two america was thought of only as a part of the continent of asia magellan detached america and gave it an independent existence but at the time of the discovery of the south sea itself columbus's idea of america as a land of pertinent and subsidiary to asia prevailed and had balboa reached peru or mexico he would have believed himself in india even by cortez mexico was thought to be the golden Cherenese. after discovering the gulf of san miguel and finding isla rica rich in pearls balboa turned northward and reached santa maria on january nineteenth fifteen hundred and fourteen here the whole people welcomed him and eagerly viewed his treasure for once in the indies however treasure to the spaniards was a thing of secondary account the new sea was what these men cared about the mar del sur what of it from darien balboa dispatched pedro de arbolancha as a special messenger to ferdinand with the great news and as typical of the new sea and of the auriferous realms where to supposedly it was tributary he entrusted to his messenger by way of gift for the king not merely gold but two hundred lustrous pearls the fruit of the waters of this great southern sea but if tales of wealth in the west had given to balboa his rise similar tales were to contribute to his fall a story gained currency that in darien the natives were accustomed to fish for gold with nets the prospect of such fishing appealed with special force to an elderly gentleman of segovia pedro arias de avila and as balboa was to be displaced and arias or pedrarius as he is known had money and friends he was made governor with jurisdiction reaching from the gulf of maracaibo to cape gracias a dios the expedition of pedrarius set sail from san lucar on april eleventh fifteen hundred and fourteen prior to this time one of the greatest expeditions to leave spain for the indies had been the second commanded by columbus which had sailed from cadiz in fourteen hundred and ninety three in point of eminence however the names connected with the expedition of pedrarius outshone those of its early predecessor in high degree there were for example gonzalo fernandez de oviedo who together with las casas had beheld the triumph of columbus after his first voyage francisco vasquez coronado de valdez quixotic and chivalric seeker after the seven cities of cibola hernando de soto discoverer of the mississippi and bernal diaz del castillo companion to be of cortez and rugged chronicler of his deeds many adventurers some two thousand men who were anxious to go had to be left behind for want of room 
those taken numbered about fifteen hundred and the show they made was brilliant enough largely they were young nobles and gentlemen who had expected to follow gonsalvo de cordoba to the italian wars and they came wearing their silks and brocades and provided with gleaming armour for which they had gone heavily into debt upon the imagination of such writes washington irving the very idea of an unknown sea and splendid empire broke with the vague wonders of an arabian tale finally pedrarius brought with him his wife the resolute isabel of bobadilla and a bishop for darien the first prelate of tierra firma juan de quevedo both the lady and the bishop it is worthy to be remarked fell under the spell of the gallantry of vasco nunez de baboa as for pedrarius himself he was skilful with the lance and had fought against the portuguese and the moors but was now elderly and somewhat infirm in temper he was arbitrary and wily sir arthur helps deems him a suspicious fiery arbitrary old man an epigrammatic american thinks he had a swarthy soul and even john fisk pronounces him a green-eyed pitiless perfidious old wretch his first business was to arrest balboa and bring him to trial for misdeeds against Encisa and Niciesa. but the charges fell flat save that Enciso, who had been given office under pedrarius was awarded civil damages for loss of property then for a period balboa was ignored and the followers of pedrarius mad for gold were let loose upon the isthmus between june thirty fifteen hundred and fourteen and january fifteen hundred and seventeen a dozen expeditions sent ostensibly to connect the atlantic ocean with the pacific ravaged the country the cruelties inflicted upon the natives were monstrous some says oviedo were roasted others were mangled by dogs others were hanged driven to desperation the indians at length turned upon their persecutors spaniards when caught were not only slain but were tortured to death legs and arms were severed by sharp stones or the captive was bound and gagged and molten gold was poured down his throat the indians meanwhile in mockery bidding the helpless christians eat eat and take your fill on leaving his ships pedrarius had sought to impress the darien settlers with his might and magnificence but the silken and brocaded lords and gentlemen who so largely constituted his retinue had not turned out well disease and famine had fast laid hold upon them forcing them to barter scarlet tunics for corn or to feed on herbage or to drop exhausted in the wilderness until their souls deserted them full seven hundred of them still these untoward circumstances bad as they were were not what exasperated pedrarius most at his side inactive but observing cogitative and critical stood balboa whom nothing escaped writing to the king on october sixteenth fifteen hundred and fifteen balboa with a touch of the style of mark antony describes the governor as an honourable man but one who takes little heed of the interest of your majesty and one in whom reigns all the envy and avarice in the world alluding to the cruelties to the indians he calls them the greatest ever heard of in arabian or christian country and says that whereas these indians formerly were as sheep now they are as fierce as wolves had pedrarius been less unsuccessful in governing than he was no single jurisdiction could have continued to hold both him and vasco nunez de balboa they were incompatible beings of whom one must go down before the other how true this was became apparent when early in fifteen hundred and fifteen the full strength of pedrarius's resentment was evoked through jealousy balboa's messenger arbo lancha who had been sent to report to ferdinand the discovery of the south sea had reached spain but shortly after the departure of pedrarius with his gold his pearls and his magic tales of balboa's preemption of the realms of ophir arbo lancha quite won over ferdinand especially as balboa had cost the crown nothing whereas pedrarius had cost it much balboa was thereupon created an adelantado of the south sea and captain-general of cueva and panama under the nominal supervision of pedrarius as governor of darien the governor well knew that an adelantado 
bordeaux ship though technically a lieutenancy was in reality a provincial governorship a kind of proconsulship and something which in the hands of a balboa might easily be transformed into a position of independent power to pedrarius two courses lay open one was to forestall the new adelantado by going to the pacific seaboard himself the other was to institute against him further public proceedings during the pendency of which his commission might be withheld emphasizing the first course pedrarius sent gaspar de morales and francisco bizarro to the west shore of the gulf of san miguel to seize the pearl islands and he sent yet farther west an expedition which reached the peninsula of parita he in person founded acla on the atlantic coast near the site of the subsequent caledonia harbour and through gaspar de espinosa alcalde mayor or chief judge of darien penetrated to the extreme west as far as the gulf of nicoya nicoya in the present costa rica the second course against balboa the withholding of his commission proved wholly a failure for the bishop of darien to whom it was of necessity disclosed denounced it roundly in public from the pulpit events now moved apace balboa after the interview of arbalancha with ferdinand received a letter from the king written in august fifteen hundred and fourteen informing him that pedrarius had been instructed to treat him well with this assurance balboa had therefore resolved to make his atalanta do ship a reality by exploring the coasts of the south sea regardless of the governor by secretly obtaining supplies from cuba balboa nearly brought about his own downfall but the situation was retrieved by bishop quevedo who persuaded pedrarius very possibly dona isabel was here a factor to become reconciled and give to the courtly balboa his eldest daughter dona maria in betrothal the arrangement whatever may have been the motive of pedrarius in countenancing it in no wise changed his feeling toward balboa an instinctive jealousy and suspicion to balboa on the contrary the arrangement was not unpleasing he still loved coretta's daughter dona maria was at school in spain his marriage with her could be deferred pedrarius meanwhile could not well oppose the passage of the adelantado his prospective son-in-law to the latter's province on the pacific what balboa needed was ships these to the number of four brigantines he built from the forest on the northern side of the sierra below alcla and thousands of impressed indians carried them in sections over the ridge to the waters of the river balsas sabana which flowed into the gulf of san miguel but the timbers proved rotten and the work of shipbuilding had to be done all over again done however it finally was and balboa stood exultant on the beach of isla rica gazing south seaward the nights at this season were clear we are told and a certain great star rode in the heavens above now it seems that just after balboa's discovery of the pacific a venetian travelling astrologer who was in santa maria had pointed out to him the star telling him that when it attained in the heavens a definite point he was to beware as mortal peril faced him the crisis safely passed he would be fortune's child the greatest lord and captain in all the indies and with all the richest turning to friends who were with him balboa on one occasion spoke of the star and ridiculed the astrologer have i not he said three hundred men and four ships and the countenance officially of pedrarius from time to time news had reached darien that as balboa had been superseded by pedrarius so the latter was to be superseded by lopa de sosa acting governor of the canary islands such news now that balboa was on working terms with pedrarius was not welcome to him for a change in governors might cause him delay so the adelantado remarked to his notary that it would be well to send to acla to ascertain whether lopa de sosa were yet arrived if he were then balboa could not put to sea too soon if he were not some much-needed iron and pitch might be obtained and the preparations could be continued four men composed the party to go to acla andres carabito luis botelho fernando munoz and andres de valderabana 
they were to make their visit by night and to gather information from the servant who would be found in balboa's house but the crisis foretold by the astrologer registered by the star had come garabito under a dissembling exterior hated balboa for having admonished him against attempted familiarities with coretta's daughter he had even written to pedrarius that balboa cared not for dona maria to whom he was betrothed and meant at the earliest opportunity to renounce the governor personally as well as politically furthermore the remark of balboa about a speedy putting to sea had been overheard by a sentry who mistaking it for treason had so reported it to garabito or botelho finally the period within which the adelantado was to be ready for sea under agreement with the governor had been much exceeded and pedrarius would not extend it and when balboa's chief financial backer fernando de aguello wrote advising a putting to sea at once the letter was intercepted garabito and botelho on their nocturnal visit to acla were both apprehended and what they related to pedrarius deeply implicated balboa in disloyalty and intrigue how the story roused pedrarius primitive spaniard that he was to a cold fury distinctly appears in the countermeasures which he took to balboa he penned a beguiling letter inviting him to come to acla to francisco pizarro the model subordinate the ever dutiful one he at the same time gave orders to gather a force meet balboa and arrest him the adelantado came warnings he received but he disregarded them before he had crossed the sierra he was met by pizarro's force the leader himself stepped forward and made the arrest it is not thus said balboa smiling sadly that you were wont to come forth to receive me francisco pizarro balboa's trial was conducted by the alcalde mayor or chief judge gaspar de espinosa and the adelantado's entire record from the days of enciso and nisuesa was admitted against him even so he would have been allowed an appeal to the crown had it not been for the governor who would not assent to it at santa maria in the plaza a scaffold and block were prepared and early in the morning of a day in january fifteen hundred and nineteen balboa was led forth in chains before him walked the town crier exclaiming behold the traitor and usurper tis false retorted balboa never have i been disloyal with this he mounted the scaffold and received the sacrament his head was then cut off upon a hatchment cloth and stuck upon a pole the same day until past nightfall were beheaded in ghastly succession valderabano batelio munoz and arguello pedrarius it is said witnessed the executions from behind the shelter of a lattice while as for garabito he reaped a not uncommon reward of treachery in the salvation of his own life thus the third voyage of columbus the voyage for pearls brought about as a first great result the occupation of that part of the mainland of america now known as the isthmus of panama and the discovery of the pacific ocean as its second great result it brought about though less directly the occupation of mexico a tale which remains to be told End of chapter three chapter four part one of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four cortez and mexico where dwell the gods where dwell the gods oh dwell they in the sky the gods are always nigh raymond the aztec god but what of the young nobleman valdivia o oh, you wretched men of darien exclaims peter martyr tarry for valdivia whom you sent to provide to help your necessities provide for yourselves rather and trust not to them whose fortune ye know not juan de valdivia it will be remembered had in january fifteen hundred and twelve set out from santa maria of darien for espanola to solicit of don diego columbus a supply of food his return long looked for never came his ship was wrecked off jamaica and he was carried in an open boat 
with a few followers to the coast of yucatan here he was seized by the local cacique and with three others was sacrificed to the gods his heart being torn out and his flesh eaten some of the company were kept prisoners one by one they died till two only were left gonzalo guerrero a seaman and geronimo de aguilar a friar both of whom some eight years later were found as will be seen by cortez columbus never reached yucatan but on his first voyage he heard of the culture of a people called the mayas who wore clothes and dwelt on a mainland ten days journey in a canoe from espanola and on his fourth voyage he came on july thirty fifteen hundred and two into actual touch with this civilization near the island of guanaya off the coast of honduras here he encountered a monster canoe provided with an awning and laden with merchandise a canoe bearing a cacique clad in loincloth and mantle one furthermore which was being propelled by a band of twenty-five indians well clothed nor was columbus's acquaintance with the maya culture limited to the sight of the canoe near cariari nicaragua he personally visited a mountain tomb as large as a house and elaborately sculptured where there stood or crouched as though peering within the corpse of a maya indian he saw also he tells us some large sheets of cotton cloth elaborately and cleverly worked and other sheets maya manuscripts very delicately painted as compared with the nahuas of mexico pre-aztec as well as aztec the mayas of yucatan were an ancient a peaceful and a polished race and like all races that have advanced as far as barbarism they were emphatically religious their most characteristic deity perhaps was itzamna god of the east or rising sun inventor of letters but there was another sun deity kukulkan the most active and eminent of the maya gods he was patron of arts and crafts inculcator of peace and withal deprecator of human sacrifices a god of order who having founded cities had departed into the sunrise whence he had promised to return at a future time war gods there were in the maya pantheon but war and religion despite some human sacrifices were not the intimate blend that they were in mexico if the death of aldivia and his three fellow unfortunates upon a heathen altar may be regarded as demanding of heaven to be avenged vengeance nevertheless was somewhat delayed valdivia died in fifteen hundred and twelve up to that time but little had been done to subdue and occupy the antilles outside of espanola in fifteen hundred and nine diego columbus had sent a governor to jamaica and in fifteen hundred eleven he had made diego velasquez governor of cuba a land which christopher columbus had never recognized as insular but which had been officially demonstrated so to be by a voyage of circumnavigation effected by sebastian de ocampo in fifteen hundred and eight velasquez was jocose and affable but at the same time acquisitive and envious to cuba he took with him or soon summoned to follow him francisco hernandez de cordoba juan de grijalva bartolome de la casas panfilo de narvarez and hernan cortez narvarez did the work of pacification while velasquez founded trinidad puerto del principe matanza santo espiritu san salvador habana and santiago 
in fifteen hundred sixteen because of the continued famine in darien governor pedrarius gave leave to his silken host as many as wished to go to cuba where provisions were not lacking and one hundred and ten went velasquez met them cordially and promised them land if they would wait for vacancies but they were tired of a passive role and craved activity slave catching though contrary to law was at this time practised in the island and it no doubt was with the profits from such an enterprise in view that the darien arrivals made ready an expedition which would serve as an outlet for their energies they chartered two vessels velasquez it is said contributing a third and on february eighth fifteen hundred and seventeen with hernandez de cordoba now a rich planter of santo espiritu as captain unfurled their sails from san cristobal the old habana whither should they fare their chief pilot counselled adventuring straight into the west into the region of the people who wore clothes the squadron about the first or second of march reached the island of las mugueras island of women and on the fourth landed at point catoche the extreme northeasterly limit of yucatan their next landing was at champoton in campeche where they tediously worked their way back to san cristobal by way of the peninsula of florida on this expedition the spaniards were roughly handled by the natives both cordoba and bernal diaz were wounded the former so severely that soon after reaching cuba he died but the invaders succeeded in bringing away two youths whom they named respectively melchor and julian and to whom they taught spanish that they might serve as interpreters foiled as to slave-catching but curious regarding yucatan the cuban settlers by fifteen hundred and eighteen were ready for a second adventure into the west and this time it was Velasquez who took the lead he managed to add two vessels to two others left from the expedition of cordoba enlisted some two hundred and fifty men and appointed juan de grijalva commander-in-chief sail was made from santiago de cuba on the eighth of april with alaminos once more as chief pilot and on the third of may the fleet gained to the southward of point catoche a large island called cozumel island of swallows by the last of the month the expedition had passed lake terminas and by the eighteenth of june various rivers of tabasco such as rio de grijalva and rio de banderas and various islands off mexico including san juan de ulia and isla de sacrificios they made a landing where now stands the city of vera cruz grijalva under the orders given him might trade in any regions discovered but he might not colonize and as the country everywhere by its aspect invited to colonization alvarado on the twenty fourth of june was permitted to sail for cuba to carry back the sick report progress and if possible obtain permission to form settlements meanwhile grijalva followed the mexican coast as far north as cape royo whence returning to yucatan he sailed for cuba reaching mantanzas about the first of november on both the cordoba and grijalva expeditions the spaniards were impressed by divers things but more than with anything else by the scenery the sacrificial mounds and the stone temples on every island and dotting the coast of the mainland were to be seen mounds pyramidal in form ascended by stone steps and surmounted by temple towers of squat masonry the towers gleamed white and over them floated the smoke of incense and of sacrifice at campeche cordoba saw many temples or prayer palaces wedded within with fresh blood from each there swarmed angrily forth half a score of priests armed with braziers and clad in white mantles down which fell their hair long black and dishevelled so matted and clotted with blood from their own ears lacerated in penance that one strand could not be separated from another 
indeed the farther to the west the spaniards fared the closer their approach that is to say to the nahua tribes of mexico as distinguished from the maya of yucatan the more the evidences of human sacrifices multiplied why asked grijalva of a tabasco indian this ripping open of human bodies an offering of bloody hearts to hungry gods because was the reply the people of yulia by which was meant mexico will have it so when in november fifteen hundred and eighteen grijalva reached cuba then called isla fernandina he found himself most undeservedly out of favour he was young handsome and chivalric but above all conscientious so conscientious that las casas tells us he would have made a good monk having been ordered not to plant colonies he had obeyed but obedience proved to be his undoing for angered by it his subordinates particularly alvarado whom he had reproved had misrepresented him to velasquez and already that grasping ruler had decided upon a new voyage in which grijalva was not to share for this new voyage velasquez sought a commander of quite supermundane qualities one astute and valiant enough to achieve rare deeds and at the same time subservient enough to give all the honours and emoluments to velasquez the governor profiting by grijalva's labours had already on the thirteenth of november secured for himself the andalanta ship of all that he had discovered in the west or might thereafter discover there and his solicitude to make just the right choice of a commander was intense then as not seldom in human affairs stepped in fate the ironical mocking fate to diego velasquez tremulous with apprehension lest he choose wrongly for himself fate dictated the selection of hernan cortez it has been said that the rise of cortez was due to the third voyage of columbus and the statement is true in that his rise was part of the movement following upon columbus's pearl discoveries a movement which through nicduesa and ojeda begat balboa and through balboa begat pedrarius and through pedrarius those activities in cuba which resulted in the expeditions of cordoba and grijalva apropos of columbus in this connection regret at times has found voice that it was not he who conquered mexico rather than cortez there it is said he would have found fulfilment of his dream of gold if not of spicery in measure far more complete than in asia and india for in the fifteenth century the cathay of marco polo as also polo's sipangu were vanished things but to each his task the mexican conquest called for traits at least one of which ruthlessness columbus did not possess it called that is to say for the traits which were peculiarly spanish and it called for all of them for ruthlessness for pride for devoutness and for romanticism these traits combined and co-ordinated in a unique manner belonged to cortez hernan cortez was born in medellin in estramadura in fourteen hundred and eighty five his parents were as who in those days in spain was not of noble descent though poor as he was delicate in health he was destined for the law at fourteen he entered the university of salamanca where he remained two years acquiring a smattering of latin and some ease in rhetoric on leaving the university he looked about him he might join the banner of the great captain cordoba as had been the frustrated purpose of so many of the followers of pedrarius or he might go to the indies the indies were his choice and thither in fifteen hundred and four he took passage this was the period just subsequent to the coming of nicolas de ovando to espanola as governor and cortez after some hesitation was induced by ovando to become a planter in fifteen hundred and ten he would have joined nicuesa on his veragua castillo del oro expedition but was prevented by an abscess under the right knee 
in fifteen hundred and eleven diego velasquez who admired his intelligence took him to cuba as business adviser or private secretary cortez was young and famed for his amorous gallantries according to reports not altogether illuminating his affairs in cuba involved him in discord with velasquez catalina suarez was the name of one of his enamoratas and her he married by fifteen eighteen velasquez despite differences had appointed him alcalde at santiago de cuba cortez was now thirty-three he was of medium stature compact and muscular and had dark eyes good features a short beard and legs a trifle bowed outwardly he was frank and vivacious but inwardly he was calculating and self-contained since fifteen hundred and sixteen in espanola diego columbus as admiral and governor had been under the supervisory authority of three monks known as the geronimite fathers who had been sent to the indies at the instance of las casas to temper somewhat with mercy the dealings of spaniards with the natives and it was necessary to obtain from them sanction for enterprises such as that for which velasquez had selected cortez velasquez obtained the requisite sanction and on the twenty third of october before grijalva's own return from the west he issued instructions authorizing as in grijalva's case exploration but not colonization cortez was now energy itself he mortgaged his estate he secured a large contribution from velasquez he stuck a plume in his bonnet he hoisted a banner he issued proclamations by these means and by enacting throughout a jovial role he gathered out of cuba and jamaica eleven vessels five hundred and eight soldiers and one hundred and nine seamen by february tenth fifteen hundred nineteen but there were difficulties and the gravest of these was a distrust of cortez which was more and more perceptibly defining itself in the mind of the governor like the chorus in the drama of antiquity the fool or jester of early modern drama performed a work of prognosis he forecast the issue such a fool de iago columbus had about him officially in the person of a sharp-witted dwarf named francisquillo this oracle unlike the fool in lear did not say openly to his master thou hadst little wit in thy bald crown when thou gavest thy golden one away but he said what was equivalent to it to velasquez as one day along with cortez he surveyed the harbour of santiago alive with the preparation of cortez's fleet francisquillo who was capering about exclaimed have a care diego diego lest this estramaduran captain of yours make off with the fleet herein it is said the distrust on the part of velasquez took its rise cortez did not slink from santiago with his ships in the night he left openly in the daytime after embracing the governor but he was nevertheless closely watched indeed velasquez's distrust of him continued to grow for he made frantic efforts to supersede him at trinidad and to stop him and apprehend him at san cristobal in his train cortez took a notable band of spanish gentlemen ten staunch captains each in command of a company with himself in command of the eleventh the arms carried were thirty-two crossbows thirteen firelocks and an outfit of swords and spears the whole reinforced by artillery in the form of ten bronze guns breech loaders and four falconets but above and beyond all else were sixteen noble horses about which more anon the general rendezvous was cape san antonio the most westerly point of cuba whence on the eighteenth of february the expedition all save pedro de alvarado's ship which was driven aside by tempest set its prows for cozumel at this time there was no knowledge in the indies of the fate of the valdivia party but on the cordoba expedition indians of campeche had saluted the spaniards with the word castellan and this was deemed significant at any rate after much inquiry on the yucatan coast and much dispatching of messengers inland aguilar appeared though guerrero did not 
provided thus with a reliable interpreter for melchor and julian had proved wanting and aguilar was willing cortez early in march set sail with his fleet for the country of the cacique tabasco the halting point of the spaniards was an island in the tabasco or grijalva river but when they sought to establish themselves on the mainland christened by cortez new spain they were vigorously withstood a fight took place on the twenty fifth of march and fortune was turned in favor of the spaniards and against overwhelming bodies of indians by the artillery and the horses in darien where the natives were lower in the scale of barbarism than in yucatan and mexico balboa had already won triumphs by the aid of powerful dogs but to the east of the gulf of uraba that region of the poisoned arrow dogs had not been found effective and in yucatan and mexico where the missiles most in use were darts javelins sling stones and the obsidian edge sword club or maquahutl dogs save for hunting purposes were eschewed what in darien was accomplished by the dog was accomplished in the region farther west by the horse at tabasco or rather on the plain of kutla near by the horses supported by the cannon therefore won the day the indians who covered the whole plain who wore great feather crests and quilted cotton armor who carried drums and trumpets and rained upon their foe arrows javelins and stones were finally hemmed in between the spanish guns which ploughed through their masses and the spanish horse who under cortez himself speared them down and so were brought to a stand in the eyes of the terrorized barbarians the guns with their thunder and lightning were a marvel but the horsemen were a greater marvel still for they were each a living monster horse and rider in the words of bernal diaz being all one animal it was at the close of this battle that the tabascans suing for peace brought to cortez twenty young women among them dona marina as she came to be known a truly great chieftainess a daughter of caciques and a mistress of vassals marina was aztec but as a little girl had been given by her mother to the indians of tabasco in order to make way for the succession of a half-brother to the headship of her tribe cortez at first did not bestow upon her especial notice merely as assigning her to a distinguished gentleman what made her fortune was her knowledge of both nahua and maya speech combined with her intelligence the rescued aguilar who spoke the maya of yucatan and tabasco readily understood the maya of tabasco as spoken by marina so as it proved the chain of tongues indispensable to cordez was complete marina translating aztec nahua into tabascan maya which aguilar in turn put into castilian spanish cortez who no less than columbus was devout spent palm sunday of the year fifteen hundred and nineteen at tabasco where a religious procession was held and mass was sung and where the indians were stoutly exhorted to give up their bloody sacrifices and idols the fleet then set sail and by holy thursday was at the island of san juan de ulioa where the spaniards first came to a definite knowledge of the existence and importance of montezuma it is true that at tabasco grijalva had heard of a calua or ulua where there was plenty of gold but in the words of the chronicler we did not know what this culia could be at san juan de ulia the fleet of cortez lay at anchor its fiery purpose clothed as some one has said in dissembling white hardly had it assumed its position when from two large canoes there ascended to the deck of the flagship a group of indians asking for tlatoan or chief they did him reverence but beyond this they were unable to make themselves understood thereupon marina who with other slave girls was standing by said to aguilar that the indians were mexicans sent by the cacique quitlal pitak a servant of montezuma and that he wished to know whence the strangers had come and why so was begun a series of interchanges between cortez and the overlord of culua or mexico interchanges conducted on the part of the one with veiled 
though ever mounting audacity and on the part of the other with veiled though ever deepening apprehension for more than a fortnight cortez encouraged the coming of embassies for trade first came quitlao pitak accompanied by his superior tutulili and with them they brought cotton fabrics done in brilliant feather designs ten bales of them as also articles of wrought gold set with rare stones in return cortez gave a carved and inlaid armchair some engraved stones a crimson cap beads and a gilt helmet which toot lily had wondered at and was told to bring back filled with gold dust the spaniard asked also for a time and place to be fixed at which he might meet montezuma then in due season came a second embassy one headed by a cacique named quintalbor who in looks resembled cortez with quintalbor came tutulili and this time besides cotton fabrics embroidered in feathers and gold there were brought large plumes of bright colours spangled with gold and pearls great feather fans rods of gold like a magistrate's staff collars and necklaces with pendant golden bells headdresses of green quetzal feathers and gold or of feathers and silver miniature golden fish alligators ducks monkeys pumas and jaguars a graceful bow with twelve sharp arrows all these things to say naught of nahua books executed in picture writing upon cotton or bark nor yet were these things all for dominating the entire collection were a wheel of gold as large as a cartwheel a wheel of silver equally large the twain worth in american money of to-day some two hundred and ninety thousand dollars and the helmet at which tutulili had wondered filled with grains of gold fresh from the places the object of this second embassy was clearly to bribe cortez into leaving the country for to his wish again earnestly expressed to visit montezuma many objections were courteously interposed the refusal indeed was soon made pointed and explicit for tutulili having gone through the form of carrying to his lord the spanish leader's reiterated request came back after ten days bearing a quantity of robes feathers and gems as a gift to be carried by cortez personally to his own overlord the spanish king having thus felt out montezuma and his magnificence cortez saw his goal before him but could he reach it reach it he must if he would escape outlawry already he had broken with velasquez for at tabasco he had taken possession in the name of the king alone his position was like that of balboa after he had deported and ciso and had heard of the golden shored pacific he must seize his opportunity he must do or die as a first step cortez resolved upon a new basis for his expedition the soldiers must become a spanish colony looking immediately to the king over this colony he himself must be chosen captain-general and justicia mayor as such he could found a settlement taking care by destroying his fleet to remove from his followers all temptation to resume relations with cuba and velasquez even so however the situation for cortez was fraught with difficulty assuming the successful establishment of direct relations with charles v successor to ferdinand on the spanish throne how about the indians what would be their attitude toward the appropriation of montezuma's wealth by the arrogant white strangers the white strangers from out the sunrise but just here a stroke of fortune across the sand dunes above the san juan de ulua anchorage came one day soon after the departure of the last of the embassies from montezuma five indians they were not aztec but two of their number spoke nahua and by aid of marina and anguilar it was quickly learned that they were totonacs subject to montezuma and hating him with a deadly fear their principal settlement kempoala was a short distance inland to the north and here eager for a conference with the white chieftain waited their cacique into the hands of cortez was given a possible solution of his difficulty and he was not slow to perceive it cortez approached kempoala overland with four hundred men 
and two light guns while the fleet ascended the coast some ten leagues to a harbour called bernal discovered by francisco de montejo at the anchorage opposite san juan de ulua the present vera cruz it was not only hot and damp but according to bernal diaz there were always there many mosquitoes both long-legged ones and small ones the way to Kempuala wound through tropical forests filled with birds of startling plumage and dominated throughout by the snow-crowned peak of orizaba star mountain gleaming in majesty to the south and west as for the settlement itself it was the first great town the product of barbarism which the spaniards had seen from out a plaza rose towered temples on pyramidal foundations while the sides of the square were formed by terrace roof buildings of stone and adobe the whole brilliant with white stucco Kempuala was dazzling but no less was it beautiful not only did it shine like silver of which some of the spaniards at first thought it to be constructed but its houses were embowered in green and against this green and the white walls beneath glowed the massed colours of tropical flowers roses in particular abounded as the spaniards entered and marched along they were met by deputations which showered roses upon the horsemen to cortez some handed bouquets while others flung rose garlands about his neck or placed wreaths on his helmet the foot soldiers too were remembered for to them were given pineapples cherries juicy zapotes and aromatic anonas the palace or official abode of the cacique was at length reached and though that personage was very sedate he was so corpulent and shook so when he walked that the spaniards could not be restrained from laughing at him hardly had cortez arrived in the Kempualan district when proof of the dread which the overlord of ulua or mexico inspired was dramatically revealed five of montezuma's tribute men appeared haughty and insolent was their mien and upon them the Kempualans attended like slaves their shining hair says bernal diaz was gathered up as though tied on their heads and each one was smelling the roses that he carried and each had a crooked staff in his hand the meaning of the visit was that montezuma resented the fact that Kempuala was entertaining the white strangers especially as by the last embassy sent to cortez it had been made plain that their presence in mexico was no longer desired expiation therefore was demanded and of the Kempualan youth men and maids twenty must accompany the tribute men to ulua and yield their hearts upon the altar cortez's purpose in Kempuala was to cement an alliance with the totonacs yet to avoid as long as possible a break with the lord of ulua he secretly ordered the Kempualans to throw montezuma's envoys into prison and to withhold tribute at the same time he ingratiated himself with montezuma by covertly liberating the prisoners and sending them to their lord with the tale of their deliverance at his hands montezuma therefore reopened relations with the spanish leader by sending a further embassy bearing presents upon this delegation cortez wrought with great effect by resorting to his never-failing dependence the horse verily to the mexicans the neck of the horse was clothed with thunder the glory of his nostrils was terrible he swallowed the ground with fierceness and rage and said among the trumpets ha ha having concluded an alliance with the totonacs cortez founded in june fifteen hundred and nineteen in bernal harbour his projected settlement the town of villa rica de la vera cruz and in july he sent to the king letters explanatory of the proceeding just prior to this in renewed fury of missionary zeal a fury which father olmedo priest to the army did his best somewhat to restrain he had thrown down the idols at Kempuala and cleanse the temples of blood his next acts were to scuttle and sink his ships to lash mutilate or hang various velasquez conspirators and to frighten away an expedition sent out by the governor of jamaica there now remained as the one sole objective of the spaniards in mexico 
montezuma and his goal montezuma is lord of many kings his equal is not known in all the world in his house many lords serve barefooted with eyes cast down to the ground he has thirty thousand vassals in his empire each of whom has one hundred thousand fighting men each year twenty thousand persons are regularly sacrificed in his dominions some years fifty thousand montezuma dwells in the most beautiful the largest and the strongest city in the world a city built in the water possessing a noble palace and plaza one of the centre of one the centre of an immense traffic hither flock princes from all the earth bringing incalculable riches no lord however great is there who does not pay tribute and no one so poor is there who does not give at least the blood of his arm the cost of all is enormous for besides his household montezuma is constantly waging war and maintaining vast armies these words of the cacique Olintitl, echoed in the ears of cortez as on august thirty one fifteen hundred and nineteen he departed from the friendly totonac country on his way to pay that visit to montezuma which had been so persistently declined had it been columbus what more of confirmation would he have required that he was about to behold the city and court of the great khan as it was even the practical-minded cortez felt himself impelled to write according to our judgment it is credible that there is everything in this country which existed in that from which solomon is said to have brought the gold for the temple end of chapter four part one chapter four part two of the spanish conquerors by irving burdine richmond this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four cortez and mexico mexico tenochtitlan abode of the war-god the place of the stone and prickly pear seat of the power of montezuma whereof the spaniards had heard under the name yulia was a wonderful place to the spaniard but he failed to understand its real significance what the spaniard found in mexico as he believed was merely a feudal monarchy under a king supported by a nobility occupying palaces in a picturesque city full of mosques in point of fact cortez unwittingly was looking across an abyss of perhaps ten thousand years actually seeing the dead past live again to say remarks john fiske that it was like stepping back across the centuries to visit the nineveh of sennacherib or hundred gated thebes is but inadequately to depict the situation for it was a longer step than that yes immeasurably longer for it was a step from civilization quite to mid-barbarism what it really was that tenochtitlan disclosed to the spaniards may perhaps be best conceived by the aid of a survey from the summit of one of the so-called mosques the central valley of mexico is a plateau some seven thousand four hundred feet above sea level about sixty miles long by forty broad and surrounded by mountains here the waters collected by drainage as in a basin spread themselves out in three shallow lakes or lagoons of which chauco and zechimilico are fresh and tezcoco is salt covering in all perhaps four hundred and forty two square miles near the western side of lake tezcoco are two marsh islands and over them extends the community of mexico tenochtitlan with its adjunct Tlatelolco. this community which is not at all a city or municipality is of about one-fourth the extent of the mexico city of the present day and harbors at this early time a population of perhaps seventy thousand souls 
connection with the mainland is maintained by three long causeways one to the north one to the west and one to the south each twenty or twenty-five feet broad and of a cement construction which is hard and smooth these causeways provided as they are with sluice gates serve also as dikes for regulating the flow and depth of the water to the west of the islands where it discharges from chauco and zachimilico which are at a higher elevation than tezcoco for similar control to the eastward of the islands a long dike exists besides the three main causeways there are certain tributary ones and a double aqueduct of concrete bringing water from the mainland hill of chapultepec turning now our gaze more directly beneath we perceive first that the centre of the main community tenochtitlan is marked by a great square nine hundred by one thousand fifty feet facing the cardinal points and surrounded by a stone wall eight or nine feet high embellished with carved stone serpents in this wall on each side of the square there is a gate and each gate is approached from without by a broad avenue those leading to the north south and west gates being prolongations of the causeways by the square and avenues the main community is divided into four quarters the adjunct to Lato constituting a fifth division and each quarter is intersected by canals spanned by bridges the great square in tenochtitlan forms the place of trade and concourse and in tlatelalco a like square subserves the same so far as buildings are concerned they are of four principal sorts first huge communal dwellings next official edifices or tecpans then armories or houses of darts as they are called and lastly temple structures comprehending educational houses and quarters for priests the material of all is a reddish stone for the most part whitened to brilliance by stucco and the foundations as a rule are pyramidal in shape the great square is filled with temples twenty at least without counting the chief temple and Tlatelalco also has its temples a chief and lesser ones if the hour of observation from our mosque be sunset the picture will be charming in the pale blue water sheet of tezcoco will be reflected not alone the white buildings of mexico tenochtitlan but those of other similar communities on the shores the whole relieved against a dark blue sierra crowned by the peaks gigantic and roseate of iztachihuatl white woman and popocatapetl smoking mountain on the other hand if we look at night charm will be replaced by an aspect weirdly sinister spectral barks or canoes fifty thousand of them it is said will be darting athwart the lake and through the brazier lighted canals while aloft the darkness will everywhere be pierced by temple flames a modern smelting works somewhat softened might suggest the effect open daylight however will best reveal mexico tenochtitlan to the high-placed observer by it the communal dwellings will be seen to be of wide extent but of only one or at most two stories in the latter case receding or terraced and provided with low parapets the principal tecpans of which there are two one being in tlatelalco are surmounted by observation towers and the pyramids of the temples are bulky structures of smooth stone dented on one or more sides by steps and culminating in wooden oratories terrible indeed is the religion of the aztec nahua its leading deity is huitzilopochtli god of war and to him chiefly is consecrated the greatest pyramid of all it stands in the broad square of tenochtitlan 
it is three hundred feet wide on each side at the base and with its oratories it rises to a height of one hundred and fifty feet here under one's very nostrils as one gazes reeks the blood of human sacrifices blood offerings performed by filthy priests who in the curt phrase of bernal diaz stink like sulphur and have another bad smell like carrion a second great deity shares with the war-god his ensanguined abode tezcatlipoca god of the breath of life the racial god of the nahua near by are the temples of two other important gods Thlaloc, a god of rain and fertility and quetzalcoatl counterpart of the maya kukulkan god of order enlightenment and humaneness the blonde and bearded god the fair god of romance but it is not merely the exteriors of houses that daylight in tenochtitlan best reveals interiors respond to it even more here will be seen courts supplied with ponds and fountains the abode in some instances of wild beasts and birds chambers with floors and walls brought to a hard finish by cement and gypsum and decked with featherwork hangings mats and cushions and provided with low canopied beds low tables and stools flint and copper implements and of varied pottery between many of the buildings too are green garden plots and in the lake floating vegetable gardens and in the squares both of tenoch titlan the and Tlatelolco, huge markets in full tide of activity of much interest is all this but obviously interest of a limited sort what of the inner self of the aztec what of his soul as disclosed by his religion the soul of the aztec is dark war feeds it and blood anoints it but art is a second medium of soul disclosure and through it the soul of the aztec is revealed as not inhospitable to light and beauty of aztec art feather work is the most striking example but metal work flower culture and poetry are also striking examples especially flower culture and poetry campoala is a place of roses mexico tenochtitlan is even more such a place roses peep above the parapets of the communal dwellings and tecpans bloom in the chinampas or floating gardens depending garlands from the breasts of idols no occasion is there that roses do not grace be it festival baptism wedding or funeral and though the form of arrangement be off that of the pyramid or the sacrificial mound beauty veils the tragedy of the suggestion when therefore the aztec poet dreams and sings it is flowers roses for the most part and other things of a flower-like fragility that he celebrates hummingbirds butterflies song-birds and precious stones i wonder where i may gather some pretty sweet flowers whom shall i ask suppose that i ask the brilliant hummingbird suppose that i ask the yellow butterfly they will tell me i polished my noble new song like a shining emerald i arranged it like the voice of the tzinitzkan bird i set it in order like the chant of the zakwan bird i mingled it with the beauty of the emerald that i might make it appear like a rose bursting its bud they led me within a valley to a fertile spot a flowery spot where the dew spread out in glittering splendour where i saw lovely fragrant flowers lovely odorous flowers clothed with the dew but even amid songs of rejoicing rarely is there wanting the minor chord the plaintive strain common to primitive man weeping i the singer weave my songs of flowers of sadness i lift my voice in wailing i am afflicted as i remember that we must leave the beautiful flowers the noble songs only sad flowers and songs are here in mexico and tlatelalco ohuaya ohuaya the spaniard beholding mexico tenochtitlan with its adjunct tlatelalco failed to comprehend it 
and his failure save lately and in the case of a few persons has been our own the mexico city or municipality of the spaniard was in fact an indian pueblo it had been founded in thirteen hundred and twenty five by southward roving indians the aztecs a tribe few in number and near starvation finding the rich mexican valley already occupied the aztecs took as their portion the two neighboring islands in lake tezcoco and devoted themselves to their principal need the production of food chiefly maize and cocoa the tribe in process of time became fierce bloody and prosperous and it was the struggle for food that made them so this struggle for subsistence indeed is the key to aztec life and institutions to this struggle was it due that the inhabitants of tenochtitlan planted gardens and invented the floating garden to this was it due primarily that feeling the need of controlling communication with the mainland they built causeways which might be utilized as dikes to this was it due that feeling the need of a water supply and of an increased amount of food they mustered courage and conquered portions of the mainland nearest to them to this was it due that growing in population and power and needing yet more food they forced into existence a tripartite confederacy to levy contribution over an ever-widening area to this was it due that discovering the value of terror as a means of rule they developed the ancient maya nahua cult of human sacrifice at first practised infrequently into proportions at once colossal and revolting and made huitzilopochtli the god of war their local deity in chief the aztec tribe as an organism in embryo had but one head a sachem or cacique a civil leader in him seemingly were combined dual elements the above or masculine element and the below or feminine with expansion and conflict came a need of differentiation of attributes and there arose the war leader or chief of men the distinctly masculine element was now embodied in him the feminine being reserved to his associate who henceforth bore the title to many so puzzling of snake woman in the days of the spanish conquest the snake woman though often alluded to makes no particular figure the three overshadowing figures are chiefs of men montezuma quitlahuatzin and quatematzin of these montezuma is reflective and weak the other two his successors decisive and strong just here however our account of mexico to notchtitlan must cease for at the south causeway bowing stands cortez he has come with some four hundred men fifteen horses and seven light guns the route by which he travelled from the thirty first of august to the fifteenth of october has been from zocotlan southwest to tlascala a community independent of montezuma yet distrustful of the spaniard and from tlascala southwest to cholula from cholula in the valley or plain of huitzilipan the invaders have marched west to the mountain ridge connecting popocatapetla with its mate yetzakihuatla and from here early in november have surveyed the basin-like valley of mexico with mexico tenochtitlan afar off amid the waters of lake tezcoco they have then approached the border of lake chalco traversed a causeway leading to a peninsula itztapalapan and now in the community of itztapalapan itself stand days before the stonework the woodwork of cedar and other sweet scented trees the orchard and garden full of roses and fruit trees and the pond of fresh water with birds of many kinds and breeds to bernal diaz and his followers touched with the spirit of spanish romanticism the scene appears as the enchantments of the legend of amadis in the mind of montezuma meanwhile the grave question has been 
can these spaniards these strangers of the sunrise be gods when grillalva's expedition appeared off the coast in fifteen hundred and eighteen it had been reported to notch titlin that in the waters of heaven as the open sea was called floating towers had appeared from which had descended beings with white faces and hands with beards and long hair and wearing raiment of brilliant colours and round head coverings could these beings be priests or heralds of the fair god quetzalcoatla come according to the maya nahua tradition to resume sway over his people before proof could be adduced grill yava had departed and then shortly had come swift messengers with news of cortez and with pictures of his floating towers and of his fair visaged yet bearded attendants handling the thunder and bestriding fierce creatures that spurned the ground proof regarding the quality of the fair strangers was required now more than ever and so the first embassy had been sent to cortez the embassy that had carried back as a specimen of the round heavy coverings of the strangers the gilt helmet this contrivance as it chanced resembled the head coverings of the aztec gods and especially of huitzilopochtli god of war so there had been sent to cortez the second embassy bringing the headdresses of quetzal feathers now these headdresses were those of the four principal gods of the aztecs tezcatlipoca god of the breath of life huitzilopochtli god of war Talalak, god of fertility and quetzalcoatl the fair or culture god what they seemingly were meant to signify to cortez was that montezuma tentatively at any rate was willing to acknowledge the former as like himself entitled to wear them as a representative of the gods nor was this all that the wonderful gifts of the second embassy were meant to signify among the gifts as will be remembered were two great wheels one of gold and one of silver all indians of america possess a social system more or less fully worked out from the heavenly spaces the four quarters or cardinal points of direction and the three regions above below and centre the four headdresses symbolizing the four principal gods may therefore be conceived as meant to stand to cortez for the four quarters and the gold and silver wheels respectively for the above and the below something of this kind almost certainly was symbolized by the gifts which besides being in the nature of a bribe to the spaniard as a human being to depart were likewise in the nature of a propitiatory offering to him as a god or at least a high priest to be merciful whether or not the spaniards really possessed preternatural attributes it has vastly puzzled all mexico to decide the kempualans had industriously spread the idea that they did and one thing only had served to detract from the claim at tlascala where the matter had been put to a test some of the spanish horses those creatures of terror had been killed hacked apart and triumphantly devoured at feasts at cholula however cortez by the cleverness of marina had with unerring precision alighted upon an aztec plot to destroy him had as the marvelling cholulans expressed it read their very minds and thoughts and such power could pertain to gods alone but to come back to the spanish leader as he stands bowing at the south causeway outside of itzapalapan whether he be divine or human it has become apparent that his entry into tenochtitlan can no longer be prevented by gifts nor thwarted by guile montezuma therefore making a virtue of necessity is about to come forth to greet him not that machinations have ceased at all once the spaniards are beyond the drawbridges with retreat cut off once securely lodged in one of the principal tech-pans it is the purpose of the chief of men counseled thereto by the dire huitzilopochtli himself to destroy the invaders utterly and to send them in batches to the great pyramid as a savoury and acceptable blood-offering 
the point where the ceremonies incident to the meeting of montezuma with cortez are to take place is on the south causeway at acachenanco a causeway junction and here a great crowd is gathered it would seem that not alone is tenochtitlan a settlement of four divisions but that aztec territory as such outside of tenochtitlan partakes of the same plan for at the causeway junction cortez is received by four aztec sub-chiefs from tezcoco itztapalapan tecuba and coyhuacan settlements on the lake shore to the northeast southeast northwest and southwest respectively of tenochtitlan the lake is crowded with observers in canoes but the causeway itself the present calzada de itztapalapan is kept clear and down the vista which it forms rises mexico full of mystery the four sub-chiefs conduct the spaniards to the point where the south causeway merges in the south avenue the present street el rastro leading to the great square and here montezuma appears in person he comes reclining in a sumptuous litter borne upon the shoulders of attendants at sight of cortez he descends and there is spread above him a baldaquin of light greenish blue feathers with fringe of gold pearls and jade he is a man about fifty-two years old tall slender and of dignified mien and his hair is worn short over the ears his garb is a robe of radiant blue and gold and his feet are shod with golden sandals is it as priest of huitzilopochtli that he thus presents himself to cortez the possible representative of that other deity the fair god quetzalcoatl waiting to dispossess him be that as it may the four sub-chiefs habited likewise in heavenly blue advance to his support dignitaries bearing tripartite wands symbolizing the authority of the confederacy go before him while attendants sweep clean the highway and even lay carpets that the golden sandals may not touch the ground as montezuma draws near cortez dismounts from his horse and steps forward montezuma kisses the earth an act performed by pressing it with the hand and then carrying the hand to the lips and offers to cortez how much of mexico is here a bunch of roses the spanish leader moves to salute montezuma by an embrace but is restrained by a gesture and instead places about his neck a necklace of beads taken from his own person throughout the ceremony the sides of the avenue are lined with attending sages all of whom are barefoot and to none of whom is it permitted to raise the eyes to montezuma the man of great medicine the high priest when the spaniards entered mexico it was november eighth fifteen hundred and nineteen between this date and the beginning of fifteen hundred and twenty cortez and his men found lodgings in the halls and chambers of the tecpan the official house or council lodge in the great square near the great temple formerly the quarters of montezuma himself but now vacated to accommodate the spaniards montezuma having taken up new quarters in one of the vast communal dwellings here cortez made himself secure by placing cannon to command the approaches and here he was received in audience by montezuma who causing him to be seated on a very rich platform in a chamber facing a court embellished with fountains and flowers addressed him thus we believe that our race was brought to these parts by a lord whose vassals they all were and to return to his native country and we have always believed that his descendants would come to subjugate this country and us as his vassals and according to the direction from which you say you come which is where the sun rises and from what you tell us of your great lord or king who has sent you here we believe and hold for certain that he is our rightful sovereign early fruits of the occupation of the tecpan by cortez were the discovery by accident of the walled-up storeroom containing the official treasure of the aztec government 
that aladdin's cave whence had come the gold and silver wheels the burning alive of certain aztec plotters and the seizure of the person of the chief of men who transferred to the tecpan became under castilian tutelage the tool and mouthpiece of his captor during fifteen hundred and twenty complications for the invaders arose cortez contrived the seizure of the war chiefs of tezcoco and tlacopan subheads of the aztec tripartite confederacy and of the war chiefs of coyahuacan and itztapalapan two of the four subheads of the aztec district itself then further he forbade human sacrifices by both these acts he stored up trouble for himself trouble furthermore developed independently from without diego velasquez governor of cuba and adelantado of the lands over which cortez was exercising sway had at length organized a strong expedition under panfilo de narvarez a man of hollow voice to assert his authority narvarez reached san juan de ulia in april and secretly got into relations with montezuma in order to check him cortez was compelled to divide his own small command leaving one hundred and forty men under pedro de alvarado and tenochtitlan he marched forth with ninety-two men in may and before the end of the month had near Kempuala met his foe defeated him and made him prisoner meanwhile in tenochtitlan alvarado impetuous by nature and roused by tales of conspiracy among the aztecs fostered by the coming of nar Baez set upon the population while engaged in celebrating the festival of the god tezca Tlipoca, and slaughtered them without discrimination and without ruth stunned by the onslaught but rallying promptly the mexicans fiercely assaulted the tecpan where the spaniards were housed and held them in a state of siege till cortez informed of their plight by secret messengers was able to return to their relief food was running short and montezuma being appealed to induce cortez to liberate the war chief of itztapalapan quitlahuatzin by name that he might calm the people and procure it this was the beginning of the end of the official character of montezuma quitlahuatzin was henceforth recognized by the clans as chief of men and led the mexicans in desperate attempts to force the spaniards out of tenochtitlan it was now late june and departure from the lake settlement became imperative for cortez in vain did the spaniards in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle drive the aztecs from the dizzy summit of the pyramid in the great square in vain did montezuma appeal to his countrymen from the roof of the tecpan the chief of men no longer such was reviled to his face nay more was assailed by missiles and stricken in the forehead within three days he was dead and on the fourth at midnight his erstwhile jailers stole silently from the tecpan into the avenue leading west to the tacuba causeway shortest of the three routes to the mainland and interrupted by the fewest sluice ways at first undetected they had nearly gained the causeway head when the night silence re-echoed to a cry the shriek of a native woman a signal drum on the pyramid in Tlatelolco at once boomed forth a warning and secrecy was at an end it was the noche triste the doleful night the bridges over the sluice ways were gone and could not be quickly replaced men horses and booty smitten in rear and flank filled the chasms in a tangled mass cortez himself got over by the greatest difficulty alvarado it is said cleared one of the chasms by an unparalleled vaulting leap Velasquez de leon and francisco de morla fell to emerge no more of the total force of spaniards one thousand two hundred and fifty men since the capture of navarez some four hundred and fifty were missing twenty-four horses survived the catastrophe but the significance of this fact was now small neither white stranger nor horse was any longer preternatural both were proven mortal both could perish cortez after all was not the fair god quetzalcoatl was not even his priest he was not divine in any sense just human just lustful 
a dissembling conqueror of flesh and blood once on the mainland the spaniards were able to stay somewhat the aztec pursuit and though as cortez expressed it without a horse that could run or a horseman who could lift an arm or a foot soldier who could move he finally managed to round lake tezcoco on the north and so after a fierce melee at otumba on the seventh of july to reach friendly and sheltering tlascala among the saved besides alvarado were gonzalo de sandoval cristobal de olid and the indispensable marina and aguilar the capture of tenochtitlan and the reduction of the aztecs to submission were still as much as ever the objects of cortez and he resumed the task sturdily in spite of his temporary check his forces he rested and augmented surrounding peoples he coerced or conciliated the road to vera cruz he put under guard disaffection in his own ranks due to the presence of so many of Navaez's men he quieted by soothing eloquence at length on the twenty eighth of december all was ready tezcoco was occupied and thirteen vessels shallow barges which after the manner of balboa and darien had been constructed in the forest were carried in pieces across the mountains and launched on tezcoco lake between march and may fifteen hundred and twenty one the spaniards seized its palapan and other points and during may and june cortez with nine hundred spaniards and thousands of native allies eighty-six horses and eighteen guns began a systematic siege of tenochtitlan by land and water many were the advances and repulses the aztecs resisted not alone with determination but with the utmost fury they cut the great dike they converted every canal into a moat they made of every house a castle taunts and challenges no less than missiles they flung across the water and down the converging avenues by night captive spaniards goaded to the top of the tlatelalco pyramid were spectacularly slaughtered in the glow of sacrificial fires spanish valor did much toward the reduction of the great community of the lake but famine and wholesale demolition of buildings did more and on the thirteenth of august the chief of men Quatematsin, doughty successor of quitlahuatzin who had died of smallpox before the siege surrendered in despair his own person and what remained of his nation so fell mexico tenochtitlan fortunate was it for cortez that in fifteen hundred nineteen it was montezuma who held in mexico the position of chief of men had it been otherwise had this position been held by quitlahuatzin or quatematsin it may be doubted whether the sun myth of the fair god and his impending return would have been permitted to paralyze action in a sense far from fanciful montezuma sicklied or with the pale cast of thought was the hamlet of the aztecs End of chapter four